Hi, this is Kelsey Vygotsky for AP Gov Review, and in part three of our discussion of Congress in Unit 4, we're going to be looking at the role of committees a little bit more closely. Now, every committee, as we discussed in the earlier video in part two, has a certain distinction. Some committees, of course, are more powerful and more prestigious than others, both in the House as well as in the Senate, while others are not as necessarily important in terms of what is going to get you in terms of power and also remember money in terms of political action committees. So just a quick review, some of the major committees that you might see in the House could be the Ways and Means Committee or the Rules Committee, whereas in the Senate, certainly the Judiciary Committee as well as the Foreign Affairs Committee are going to be probably amongst the top committees if you're a congressperson and you want to serve on one. So with every committee, you have a chairperson. Uh, at this point, the chairperson sets the committee agenda, which is important. You're hiring staff, uh, being in charge, or assigning membership to the subcommittee. So even though you are part of a major committee, well, keep in mind that there are also subcommittees of that uh, committee itself. So it's able to divide it out. And again, it allows for more efficiency. One of the reasons why you have committees, especially in the House of Representatives, you have 435 members, and it, again, is going to allow for more efficiency. Think about how many different topics that are important to government today, everything from NASA, everything from Homeland Security and Commerce and Labor. So there are a number of different mat matters that need to be uh, understood and by assigning members to a certain committee and oftentimes they serve on more than one committee it again is going to be more efficient now really what we're going to see in the committees is really where a lot of the bulk of things happen in terms of bills where they get researched and oftentimes die as we'll talk about it just a little bit later but again committees are very very important especially subcommittees now how is the uh, chairperson going to be selected well it's typically done by secret ballot in the party so typically you're going to have the political party that has the majority is of course going to have the chairperson and it generally is based off of the seniority system this is the idea that the person who has had the most years in the majority party that's ruling in Congress is going to become the chairperson. And it's not the oldest person. You might be inclined to say, oh, seniority, you think senior. No, it just means the longest person serving in the party. So if you were 90 years old and you just you know, became a senator, well, chances are you would not be a chairperson because you were not in the party that long, despite the fact that you might be the oldest person in the Senate. Now, there are term limits, but this is only for Republicans only, and that is, of course, six years. So some of the advantages of the seniority system, well, certainly you're going to be more experienced. You have to really know uh, if you need to kill a bill, how to research a bill. Um, so those things are important. Of course, you don't want necessarily a newbie coming in and not really knowing what he or she is doing. It also allows for stability. You have an experienced person, especially one that's been there for a while, and this is rooted in tradition and of course with the stability and the experience comes this expertise and can also help in terms of reducing infighting among those who would want to be the chairperson so you could you know it puts up the idea that hey i haven't been here that long so why should i even try i can't so it automatically defers to the oldest person in terms of longest years in the senate or the house of representatives that is so getting on a committee well members of course want to be on a committee that is going to get them reelected. If you're on the committee of aging, that's probably not going to get you a lot of influence or a lot of money. And you really want to make an impact, especially as a congressperson, in terms of making policy that's going to benefit your district, also gaining influence, because again, the more influence you have, the better chance you are of getting reelected. Now, new members typically are going to express their committee preferences to the party leaders. Doesn't mean you're going to get it. And by, you know, being closer with your party loyalty, uh, chances are you're going to have a greater chance of being selected for that committee, as opposed to somebody who's not going to really have that much party loyalty. Well, what, you know, motivation would the majority party leader have in terms of putting you on a prestigious committee, especially if he or she can't count on you to support or sort of pigeonhole a bill? So ultimately, the greater party loyalty that you have, as long as the long number of years that you've put into the Senate or the House of Representatives, typically you're going to have a better chance of getting a more prestigious committee as opposed to one who is lacking in that.
So parties, of course, are going to try to grant committee preferences, but again, that is contingent upon whether or not you've been cooperative with the party. If you've been a rebel, rebel rouser, probably not going to get that prestigious committee. All right, so again, with the chairperson being selected, again, having the distinction of setting the committee agenda, a bill that you're going to be researching and hearing, hiring staff, assigning membership on subcommittees, as well as the jurisdiction of the subcommittees as well. All right, let's continue into part four of Congress. So the committees at work, this is really the bulk of what committees do. Committees have a lot of power, yet they're really not necessarily given the amount of attention uh, by the media in terms of the roles that they're going to play. So really what the committees are going to do, well, they're going to be very important in terms of legislation. Remember, of course, Congress is where the bills originate and eventually become law if they make it that far. That'll be the next video detailed. But committees work on about 11,000 bills every session. Think about that, 11,000. Of course, uh, as part of the committee, you're going to be hearing, um, holding hearings, hearing from experts, and then you're going to be marking up bills, things that need to be revised, things that need to be added, things that need to be omitted. And oftentimes, unfortunately for most bills, they're going to be pigeonholed, meaning that bills are forgotten about and never make it out of committee. That's right, pigeonholed. Remember, we said that the chairperson has the responsibility of setting the agenda. Well, with 11,000 bills, even though not every committee is going to hear 11,000, um, you know, only so many, because you only have so much time, can really be part of the committee's work. So as a result, a lot of them get pigeonholed and never ever make it out of committee. And if you've ever seen the schoolhouse rock that infamous, I'm just the bill, if you look closely or listen closely to some of the lyrics, it's talking about getting out of committee. And that's, that's the most difficult part for the bill. And then the second major function of committees is a term called legislative oversight, which we've talked about in previous videos. But this is the monitoring of the bureaucracy and its administration of policy through committee hearing. A good example of this is when, after the Benghazi attacks, legislative hearings were heard in which they interviewed Secretary of State at the time, Hillary Clinton, and you had congresspersons on both sides of the aisle interviewing her as she provided testimony. So again, Congress can also have this oversight responsibility in which they're holding the bureaucracy, in this case, the Department of State, responsible. In addition to legislative oversight, uh, along with just monitoring the bureaucracy, also as there has been more publicity, especially uh, for looking at uh, controlling the spending, uh, the oversight of spending has certainly become a major function of Congress, which of course has the power of the purse. So you do see this dual role here of Congress not only monitoring spending, but again also monitoring the bureaucracy. And again, typically we'll see oversight following some type of catastrophe or some type of major event. Again, that could be anything from 9-11 to Benghazi or any other major event. All right, and in terms of getting ahead on the committee, as we've talked about the committee chair, the most important influencer of the congressional agenda, again, anything from scheduling hearings, hiring staff, even pigeonholing bills, very important. And of course, the seniority system is very much a dominant role in terms of selecting who the chairperson will be. Now also within Congress, you have an informal organization. You have what are known as caucuses, a group of members of Congress sharing a similar interest or characteristic. There are about 300 or so, plus or minus a few, um, but they're very important in terms of pressuring committee meetings, uh, pressuring them to hold hearings, or even votes on the bills within the committee. Again, one of the most difficult things for a bill to do is to get out of the committee and get a vote for the full House because, of course, before bills are voted on in the House, they are assigned to a committee. And again, the committee can pigeonhole them or they can expedite them. Again, it really depends on how uh, fast or slow that the chairperson wants it to go through. Now, caucuses can be very effective, especially when you have a number of congresspersons applying pressure on there. Um, and good examples of this can range from anything from the Black Caucus, Native American Caucus, as well as the Sun Belt Caucus, amongst many, many others as well. So again, they can uh, exert some pressure there. Now, Congress has its own staff. Of course, each congressperson is going to have their own personal staff as well, um, but they also get help with legislation as well. You Again, as um, you have committee staff for organizing hearings, researching, writing legislation, which can be very, very um, important and can be cumbersome. It can be very intricate. 
And as a result, the committee staff can be the target of the lobbyists. Remember, lobbyists are trying to, they have some type of agenda and they might try to influence a person on a congressperson's committee staff. You also have staff agencies from the Congressional Research Service, GAO, CBO, um, that provide a number of, uh, or amount of information. So for example, uh, the GAO being the Government Accountability Office will provide estimates as to how much a bill might cost. Whereas you have the Congressional Budget Office, the CBO might provide a similar number or a different number for Congress. And we'll get into that on the next slide. But again, do know that Congress does have agencies that do research bills, especially. And as a result, that you have about 30,000 in bureaucratic positions uh, for Congress uh, just today. And as many as 3,000 people, I mean, think about that, 3,000 people can be involved in the process of just one particular bill. So as mentioned, the CRS is going to be providing nonpartisan studies, research facts, arguments for or against policy for Congress. And then you also have what's known as the GAO, the General Accounting Office, which is going to provide financial audits of money spent by the executive branch departments, investigating agencies, again, also to uh, make sure that legislative intent of the law is going to be followed. And then, of course, you have the CBO, which is going to advise Congress on possible economic effects of programs and policies, also analyzing the president's budget as well. So again, uh, for example, as you see in this political cartoon here, you have the CBO looking at this and again, scanning the costs in this case of Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act. And as depicted here, it's gonna be very, very big according to the CBO political cartoon. Okay, let's end with a review question. The committee system is more important in the House than the Senate because, and take a moment to read through the possible choices. And if you choose D, the House is so large that more work can be accomplished in the committees than on the floor, you are correct. Seniority system here does play a role in the House. So that is, we can cross off A. The Constitution mandates the committee type of committee structure. Nope, nothing in the Constitution about that. Committee members are not appointed by the president by any means. Remember, they are going to be uh, appointed by the people uh, who are in Congress of so the majority party. So that can be the Senate majority leader or the Speaker of the House. And then the majority party in the House prefers to give priority to the work of the committees. Nope, not necessarily. The best answer is D, as we were talking about with efficiency.